So innal hamdalillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina may yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa may yudlil fala hadiya lahu wa nashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa nashhadu anna sayyidana wa maulana Muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'd Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Alhamdulillah all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that today we have gathered even though it's a virtual gathering and it is not the way that we would have liked it to be which would have been live um you know inside a masjid or in the madrasa but alhamdulillah um, you know this probably gave an opportunity for more people to join in okay so today inshallah our task is to go through uh, a webinar and this is something that i've been um working on for quite a while and that's mainly because i get asked this question a lot so you know um being a teacher in hives uh you know we get asked a lot um how can i memorize the quran how do i memorize the quran another thing that we've seen is a lot of people they kind of want to memorize the quran okay so everybody has this dream of memorizing the quran but people feel a, a bit lost where do i start what do i do how does memorization work and stuff like that so inshallah um today our objective of today's webinar is number one to learn the virtues of memorizing the quran and this part we'll probably keep it quite short how to set targets and goals when it comes to memorizing the quran so how to really really make a plan okay and you know when it comes down to memorizing the quran i i personally think the plan is everything okay it's not about following the plan but it's about having a plan okay we're also going to be talking about the structure of memorizing the quran so what's the traditional structure when it comes to memorizing the quran how is it that people in the past thousands and thousands if not millions of people how did they really keep in touch with memorizing the quran so there's a structure that many people follow and that's something we'll be sharing as well uh steps to actually memorizing so how is it that we can memorize uh, you know memorize the quran in itself so when i say memorize the quran we mean like you know we, we want to sit down and we want to actually go through uh the quran learn line by line how do i do that okay so if i have a target of learning five lines six lines seven lines how do i do that so inshallah we'll be discussing some of that and most importantly uh and this is something you know even if you are a hafiz of the quran already or you have already started memorizing the quran you should definitely stay uh tuned for that one which is how to revise the quran okay so you know anybody can memorize and i really believe that but not everybody can keep it and probably all the hafiz people who have memorized the quran across the world they can probably attest to the same thing that the biggest problem is to retain the quran it is not actually memorizing the quran okay if you have questions etc please leave it on the quick bene section and inshallah we'll uh, we'll try to answer them inshallah today the course uh, is sponsored by the natural remedy um so mashallah these guys uh, they've helped us out a lot um helped us organize the course uh, and stuff and they also have exclusive discount on some of the new things that they are actually uh, selling so you've got the manuka honey and the black seed oil and uh, they're giving a discount uh, which is uh, if you type in the code asuba at checkout so it's a s dash s u b a h and inshallah um on the chat section um you know one of our colleagues from there inshallah he will be putting up the uh, details so you can have a look at that later and inshallah uh, you know do support them uh, they do support us quite a lot okay so let's start off straight uh, from virtues of memorizing the quran so let's go straight into why you know why is it that a person should even attempt to memorize the quran now we've heard lots and lots of um different ahadith probably we've probably heard lots and lots of virtues we probably heard a, a very uh, famous one which is the crown uh, on the day of judgment allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, will give a crown to your parents so what we've done is i don't want to digress and go into this topic too much because everybody knows that one of the most um, proud things that a muslim can ever do is to memorize the quran this is probably one of the greatest things a muslim can accomplish okay um so and it's not um you know just a matter of uh, physical accomplishment which is something like in this dunya that this is something that we're ac uh, accomplishing but it's more ukhrawi meaning that we're uh uh we 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 really giving um this kind of um you know our spiritually speaking or in the, speaking for the sake of akhirah this is probably one of the most 
time dedicated and exhausting thing that we can do, right? Another thing that we see is a lot of people, if they do memorize the Quran, if they are um, attached to the Quran, and this is one of the reasons why most parents, any parents that's on here can probably attest to this, that they want their children to learn the Quran. Why? Because the Quran, it creates a nur within the heart, which does the tarbiyah of the person. Okay, so many times we see it's more likely that a person who has memorized the Quran will be more practicing, right? They'll be more religious or they'll be more spiritual. They'll be more closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a hope as well. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons or one of the most important reasons why we want to memorize the Quran. So let's explore a few ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when it comes to virtues of the people who memorize the Quran. And this is just, we want to call it a starting point, inshallah. Okay, we want to call it a starting point of our um, class today. So the status of the one who memorizes Quran will be commensurated with the last ayah he memorized. So in this hadith, it was narrated from Abdullah ibn Amr that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it will be said to the companion of the Quran, the one who memorizes and studied it, read advance in status and recite as you used to do in the word for your status will be commensurate with the last ayah that you recite so one of the things that you see is in in akhirah there is darajat okay and we know this from the quran darajat meaning there are stations and stages so a person uh, when they get accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then they are normally given on a plane um, you know you could say they are given jannah at one level and the highest level of all Jannah is, is the Jannah of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is the Jannah that our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be given, right? So this is the highest level. So in between believers will be in different levels, okay, throughout Jannah. Now, a person who has memorized the Quran, their level will increase according, according to... <clears throat> Okay, so, um, you know, they, they, they will move up in Jannah according to how many ayats they have learned. So there's over 6,000 ayats of the Quran. Okay, so there's different mushaf who have different kind of, um, you know, scholars who have worked on the mushaf itself. So it varies. It could be anything from 6,300 all the way up to 6,700 ayats in the Quran, right? So you've got over 6,000 ayat in the Quran. So potentially a hafiz of the Quran can move up in Akhirah or up to 6,000 levels, okay? Up to 6,000 levels. Now you can only imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not make one level the same to other because he is khaliqu kulli shay and he is the one who creates everything and his badiru samawati wal ab he is the one who originated the heavens and the earth so obviously he has the capability and he has the uh, ability to really make different jannat for different people so we know that for every level the person this hafiz of the quran this person who memorizes the quran they will receive a different station now there's something interesting here it says that for your status will be commensurate with the last ayah that you recite meaning that you don't need to recite the whole quran you allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will will uh, will uh, reward you and elevate your station even if it you only know 10 ayats if you know 20 ayats if you know 30 ayats so it's not about knowing the whole quran so a lot of people they kind of get um, you know anxious and they start to become you know hopeless when they see that actually you know this quran is quite long if you certain must have like 600 pages the must have i used was 800 pages so when we look at 800 pages of learning we become quite scared isn't it because we start to think oh you know how am i going to learn 800 pages of quran so really here Rasul, um, you know rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through this hadith he is giving us this um kind of um consolation right that actually a person will be elevating in status depending on how much they learn depending on how much they learn so this gives hope that every single one of us can actually dedicate some time dedicate some you know effort learn some quran and retain that quran and maybe in the hereafter allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, reward us abundantly for it inshallah if you look at the next hadith, he will be with angels accompanying them. Okay, it was narrated from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the one who recites the Quran and learns it by heart will be with the noble writer scribes. 
in heaven. And the one who exerts himself to learn Quran by heart and recites it with great difficulty will have a double reward. Okay. So let's look at this hadith. This hadith praises two people. Okay. Number one is a person who actually does memorize the Quran. He learns it by heart. Okay. Now this person will be amongst the righteous scribes meaning those angels that are there to write in the hereafter so they have a very high status okay and on top of that you can spend time with them now this is where it gets really really um you know you could say hopeful okay the hadith it is who exerts himself to learn the quran by heart and recites it with great difficulty meaning that if you're trying to memorize the quran guess what? You're going to get double the reward. So it's a no-brainer, really. Okay, so there's no point saying, if I can't memorize the whole Quran, I won't memorize it. No, maybe I can just start with one surah and see where it takes me. Maybe I can start with two, like, you know, once I finish the surah, I can try a different surah and see where it takes me. As long as I have this intention that over the course of my life, I will continue to memorize the Quran. And eventually, if I pass away before I finish memorizing the Quran, I will get double the reward okay and if i pass away after i recite the quran alhamdulillah again because i will be amongst the angels on the day of judgment okay so um in in akhira and the idea is this that a lot of us we tend to think that memorizing the quran is for children yes full-time memorization of the quran is probably easier and preferable for children Okay, because for an adult, we have so much responsibilities and commitments, it becomes difficult for us to take away all of those things and just dedicate ourselves, dedicate ourselves onto um, learning the Quran. However, however, I really believe that an adult, if a child takes two years, an adult can easily take five, an adult can easily take seven, keeping up with their own commitments. Okay, so that's something I'm going to really focus on today as well. And inshallah, I will also be um, addressing issues for those people who are learning it as a child but i think most people in the west especially uk um 90 probably 99 percent of the students who learn quran are probably doing something else with it for example they're probably going to school or they're going to college or they're going to university or something like that so you know inshallah we'll be tackling those as well he will be given a crown of honor and a garment of honor to wear so it was narrated from abu Huraira that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the quran will come on the day of resurrection and will say oh lord adorn him so he will give be given a crown to honor to a crown of honor to wear. Then he will say, O oh Lord, give him more. So he will be given a garment of honor. Then he will say, O oh Lord, he be pleased with him. So Allah will be pleased with him. Then it will be said to him, recite an advancing status. For each verse, you will gain one more hasana, meaning reward for good deeds. So again, we see that the Quran will be an intercessor for you on the day of judgment. If you recite it, if you adorn the Quran, if you give it its right. And rights of the Quran is number one, to recite it. Number two, memorize it. Number three is to do act upon it. Now, they are not in any order. It's all three, okay? So the rights of the Quran is to re recite it, is to act upon it, and it is to um, memorize it. So if a person is connected to the Quran in this manner, then inshallah on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive that person, will give them a garment of honor, and he will give um, them a, a, a garment, a crown of honor as well. So for this reason alone, okay, because we are in this world to succeed the test of the hereafter. That's why we're in this world, right? Every single one of us, our job in this world is simply, how do I attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is why we're created, okay? So if we're created in this manner, it's simply, this is one of the simplest way to do it. Obviously, we have to keep up with our faraid, our obligations. We need to keep up with our wajibat, our mandates. We need to also keep up with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Otherwise, there's no proof that we are Muslims. But on top of that, these are easy, easy ways. By connecting ourselves with the Quran, we will be able to keep up with our obligations, our sunnahs, and thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor us in this manner on the day of judgment. Bithnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The parents will be given a crown to wear. Now, if uh, you know this probably this is probably one of the main reasons why many parents pursue this dream of having their children to become hafiz of the quran right and i'll be honest like me as a parent now okay uh, you know i look at my children well my child and i have a dream as well that i would want them to become a hafiz of the quran if allah accepts 
right? But the thing is, this hadith in itself is such a powerful hadith. It's narrated by Al-Hakim that it was narrated that Buraida radiallahu ta'ala anha said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever reads the Quran, learns and acts it in accordance with it. On the day of resurrection, his parents will be given a crown to wear whose light will be like the light of the sun. And his parents will be given garments which far surpass everything to be found in this world. They will say, why have we been given this to wear? It will be said because your child learned the Quran. So now for the, from this hadith alone, what do we try to do? We try to go home and you know, get our children to sit in front of the Quran and all day revise, revise, revise so that they can become a hafiz. And sometimes we kind of overstep the line, right? And we start to like, you know, put so much pressure on them that we break them and then, you know, it becomes a problem overall. But one thing you want to understand is this, all right? And this is something I remember my teacher saying to my father, okay? And he says, it's very hard for an apple to grow on a mango tree. Okay, and this is something I would say it's so important for parents to understand today. Okay, why is it hard for an apple to grow on a mango tree? It's because an apple is a complete different fruit to a mango. So it's natural that an apple won't just grow on a mango tree. Right. Similarly, if you as a parent is not dedicated to the Quran, connected to the Quran, have a relationship with the Quran, what are the chances that your child will have a dedication to the Quran? What are the chances, chances that they will be connected to the Quran? But yes, it doesn't mean that you have to become a Hafiz to, or, or, or you know, memorize the Quran completely for your child to have a go at it. No. What that basically means is you need to have some connection with the Quran, memorize some parts of the Quran, go through the experience of actually memorizing the Quran, see how difficult it is so that you can advise and relate to your child easily. Okay, this is so important. You need to be able to relate to your child, right? Why? Because when children look at their parents, they just think you've never done it. Okay, you've never been through what I'm going through. You've never went to school and then spent the next three hours after school trying to recite the Quran. You've never spent all your weekend on a hot sun, summer's day and try to learn the Quran. So sometimes put yourself in that shoe. If you're a parent and you're pursuing your children to become a Hafiz of the Quran, then, and if you're not already a Hafiz yourself, then what you should be doing is putting yourself in the shoe. Go and study the same hours they do. Go, you know, after work, maybe put two hours into memorizing Quran, experience it. And why I say experience it is so you understand how difficult it is and you can help them through experience. And I guarantee you, if you take that method, then you will easily make your, um, uh, make your, um, stu make your children hafiz of the Quran. So it's not good enough to have dream. This is called wishful thinking. When you have a, a target, a goal, but you don't make any real effort towards it. And when you don't make any real effort towards it, it's not going to happen. It's unfortunate. This is why, you know, you could say 90% of the children that go to HIFS class, they don't finish HIFS. Because um, me as a teacher, I've seen this over the years, that it's not just down because the child doesn't have the capability to learn. But it's sometimes the child does, just doesn't have the support the child needs. So this is very important. Also, as an adult, if you are connected to the Quran, then imagine the reward for your parents. Now, we know, okay, we know from the hadith of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu that there is no way on earth you can repay your parents. There is no way on earth you can repay your parents. For let's just talk about our moms, okay? Fathers, you know, it's whole, you know, it's a whole other, uh, you know, discussion. Meaning, like you know, the amount of effort, sacrifices, work, and all of this um, financial commitment they make to us. But let's talk about our mother. Just one screen that she took when she gave birth to you, you cannot pay that back if you were to bring the whole world to her knees. Okay, you can't pay that back. However, you have a chance if you're connected to the Quran. Why? Because on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them with such a reward that nothing in no pain of this world will ever be, re be remembered. Okay? You could imagine when they wear the garments of Jannah, when they wear the garments of Jannah, they are not going to remember any pain they went through in this world. So our only real chance, okay, of paying our parents back is to be connected to the Quran. Learn the Quran, connect yourself with the Quran, act upon the Quran, and be a servant 
that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that gives his full service to the Quran. And inshallah, that will be a means of salvation for ourselves, but our parents as well. So this is one place why we would want to recite the Quran. So inshallah, so hopefully those um, kind of ahadith, uh, it, it gave us an insight into uh, the importance of uh, memorizing the Quran. And, you know, really and truly, uh, you know, I don't need to go into this subject too much. We can speak about hours and hours. You know, I, I was going through the hadith a few days ago and um, of um, importance and virtues of memorizing Quran. And I'm telling you, there was hundreds. I couldn't pick. OK, I just picked the five literally randomly because we couldn't just pick because there's so many, so much virtue for a person. There's like, you know, there's, uh, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says the best of you is the one who learns the Quran and then teaches it. So, you know, you know, the hadith are endless. OK, the Quran itself praises highly of those people who take the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seriously so really and truly that's something we don't need to go into too much but we get the idea and the idea is we will we will become more dedicated we will earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we will become spiritually closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we take up the Quran memorize it act upon it and really build that connection where we become lifelong members of the Quran lifelong members of community that understands the Quran so let's look at structures of memorization. So first thing is that when it comes to learning, and we'll speak about like goals and intentions shortly, but I want to speak about understanding the structure of memorization. There's two parts when it comes to memorizing the Quran, okay? Um, one is learn the letters. Uh, first is to learn to read the Quran. So before we even go on to memorizing Quran, okay? Before we even start to memorize the Quran, we need to learn to read the Quran first. OK, so the first is learn the letter and its pronunciation. So let's start right from the beginning. OK, so I know a lot of you guys, have, you know, um, have probably, you know, especially the ones that I, I recognize the names of. Um, I know you guys have probably know how to read the Quran, but let's start right from the beginning. A person first needs to know that they need to know how to read the Quran. When it comes to learning how to read the Quran, there are three stages. Number one is to learn the letters and its pronunciation. Number two is learn to recite fluently. And number three is learn the rules of Tajweed and its applications. Okay, so those are the three stages. Now, if you think, okay, I haven't really reached any of these stages yet. Okay, I might not know, I might know how to pronounce, uh, learn letters and pronounce them, but I'm not sure about reciting fluently. Okay, what, what, what is fluent? Fluent is when you can recite without mistake. Okay, about spend about two to three minutes it's reading a page let's just call that fluent for now okay and um, then learn the rules of tajweed and its application right know when it's ghunna then learn when it's ikhfa when it's idham idhar qalb you know learn all of these rules and how to use them as well so if a person hasn't got this much done yet their dedication or their effort should be towards this now i've seen and this is i'm gonna go just straight to the extreme i've seen 60 year olds learn how to recite the quran by dedicating two to three days a week in less than six months okay so nobody has an excuse and a 60 year old man has an excuse right he hasn't done it his whole life and then you know it becomes difficult but 60 year olds have been able to do it by dedicating two to three days a week over the course of six months okay so all you need to do is find yourself okay is um find yourself out a, a teacher okay Nowadays, mashallah, you don't even need to find a teacher live. If you don't have time to do that, you can find a teacher online, mashallah, right? Find yourself a teacher or find a group that you can follow. Local, you know, contact your local madrasa, local masajid, contact, you know, go and see where is it that I can dedicate myself to learn how to recite the Quran. This is my short term goal, okay? And this should be done within six months, okay? As long as you're at it. And I'm telling you, as a especially adults, it's easy. For children, it takes a bit longer, okay? And that's because this is the first time ever and their understanding level is very different. So learning a new language is quite hard. But as an adult, it should be very easy, 
Okay, alhamdulillah, you know, you know, that's probably one of the main reasons why we started uh, Suba Academy, which was to teach Adams how to read Quran. And, you know, in the early days, that's all we used to teach. Uh, but alhamdulillah, we've seen hundreds, hundreds of people learn how to recite the Quran in less than six months. So that's, I would say, is the first step for a person who does not know how to read the Quran yet. Okay. Now, if you don't know how to read the Quran, trust me, you can become a Hafiz. I'm telling you, all you need to do is first learn how to recite the Quran. So focus on these three things. First, find out, okay, I need to learn the Qaeda, all the alphabets, how to join letters, how to, uh, you know, read, um, you know, find out what the silent letters are, what, you know, how to end sentences, how to start sentences and things like that. Then you move on to reading fluently, be able to read a page continuously without any assistance, without any help. And then we should also be focusing on our Tajweed to make sure that we are using all those rules properly. After we pass this stage, okay, then we can start memorizing Quran. And I'll speak about what to do, but understand the structure of memorizing. When it comes to memorizing the Quran, a student has three main things to focus on. A student has three main things to focus on, okay? Number one is a new lesson, which we call sabak. Okay, so in our traditional madrasa system, we call the it's the sabak, okay? But this is basically the new lesson. What are they going to memorize today? So let's give an example, Suratul Kahf, okay? So today in Suratul Kahf, the student is required to learn the first three lines, okay? And then tomorrow, they're required to learn the next three lines. So the new sabak or new lesson will be the first three lines. Then you have their previous lesson. Now, what happens is the most vulnerable part of your memorization is what you've just memorized. Okay, so for example, whatever you've memorized in the last week, that is most likely what you're going to forget very quickly. Okay, so this is a student needs to understand the importance of previous lesson and how to memorize, how to keep the retain the previous lessons, something we're going to discuss today as well. Lastly, is the revision. There's no use in learning new sabak if you do not know or new lesson if you don't uh, know your revision. Okay, and your revision is to be able, ultimately speaking, and the you know you could say the golden standard is that you're able to recite every single ayah that you have memorized from memory at any time. This is the golden standard. But obviously, there are structures and ways that you can easily get there. Okay. And, you know, different teachers have different methods to make their student go through this. And, you know, that's why it's, it is important to have a teacher. But your journey can start alone for now. Don't worry about that. Okay. So these are the three things. So whenever you memorize Quran, so let's say you pick, um, you know, let's say after this webinar, you're motivated and you want to go and pick some parts of the Quran to start memorizing. So let's say you pick today Surah Al-Mulk. So you need to understand, okay, what am I doing for new lesson? What am I doing for my previous lesson? And what am I doing for revision? Okay. And this is why I normally to an adult, and this is one structure I always recommend adults is this that because you have so limited time and you're committed to other things like work family and things like that one of the best ways to memorize is let's say on a monday you do new lesson tuesday previous lesson wednesday revision thursday new lesson so you do only one thing a day okay so because they are all intensive things now obviously um obviously uh, when it comes to um children i was part of this uh, you know i was a child when i learned how to uh, when i memorized the quran we basically get tortured and we have to do all three in one uh, go okay so you know the day starts new lesson straight after that previous lesson straight after that revision and then you get the next day you do it again you do it again and you keep going forever right uh, but alhamdulillah it works for children but when it comes to adults sometimes you have to work around that so you need to see Okay, do I have these three things? So the golden question is, do I have these three things worked out? Do I know what I'm doing about my new lesson? Do I know what I'm doing about my previous lesson? And do I know what I'm doing about my revision? If you don't have a plan for all three things, okay, then it will be difficult. It will be difficult and you are going to go off track, okay? So this is very important. I would almost say this is the golden uh, thing that you can take back from today, which is what is my plan in these three things okay now steps to memorize the quran so what are the steps to memorize the quran um, in itself so let's go into that before we go into that i want to um, answer a few questions that i've seen um um you know on, on the chats um one is it is it, it, is it better to learn to understand the quran and then become a hafiz i would say no i would say no me personally i took the route of 
uh, memorizing the Quran first and then, um, you know, understanding the Quran itself. So I would say those are two complete different sciences and you can't completely separate them and, you know, get your memorization out of the way and then understand. If you're an adult, however, if you're an adult, then because you're going to have a, a, a much longer target, okay, then I would say maybe you can mix it up a little bit, okay? But I would, um, you know, say that it's more got to do with your personal circumstances and how you're splitting up your time. So that's something, um, you know, I, I wanted to address uh, quickly. Okay, so first step. So now we're going to discuss some of the steps you need to take to memorize the Quran. So how do we, um, you know, memorize the Quran? What do I do right from the beginning? I spoke about the most important thing, which is you need to know from a practical perspective, you need to know how to recite the Quran and then understand how memorization works. OK, so now let's look at this slide, which is intentions and sincerity. OK, so ultimately, if you ask somebody, what, why do you want to recite the Quran? Okay, what is your intention in reciting the Quran? Okay, so now everybody's answer is probably I want to please Allah, right? But you need to be more specific than that. Why? Because your intention is your resolution. Okay, your intention is what's going to keep you going. Your intention is what's going to keep you motivated, right? If your intention is simply I want to please Allah, then that is a good intention and that's our initial intention but that might not keep you going because you don't know if allah is pleased or not right it's not a um you know you, you could say there's no test for gratification there's no test to see if it's working right so we need to break down our intention all right and what i would suggest um right from the beginning is write them down write down 10 reasons why do you want to memorize the quran work them out spend a week work that out don't start memorizing straight away. Try to work that, if, especially if you're an adult, especially if you're an adult, because with children, it's a bit easier to memorize the Quran because they have a teacher supervising them. They have parents who are pressuring them. So it becomes kind of a way of life. But with adults, it becomes one of those I've seen. They let go very quickly. So this is why you want to know, Dan, why do you want to memorize the Quran? OK, note down explicit reasons for example i want my parents to wear a crown on the day of judgment i want to be the ones who's accompanied by the angels i want to lead my um, community as a quran teacher this is one of the greatest professions in in you know khayrukum man ta'allam al quran rasulullah said the best of you is the one who teaches who learns and then teaches the quran so i want to be that person who teaches the quran in my spare time I want to be that person who leads people in taraweeh okay so think about all of these now yes some of these things they may you know we should make sure that we have that ikhlas in our intention but it should be because we want to serve the quran and we want it to be a means of intercession for us on the day of judgment so keep those things in mind we want to bring a couple of reasons why we want to become a hafiz or why we want to memorize the quran now next one next question is what is your initial goal OK, now I'm going to speak about phases in, in, in a few minutes, but work out what you actually want to achieve. So it's a very hopeful and very wishful thinking. If we just turn around and say, you know what, I just want to become a Hafiz, right? That's not good enough, right? That's not a good enough goal, right? What do you mean you want to become a Hafiz? How long do you want to take when you want to become a Hafiz, right? How long are you going to take when you, you know, when you're becoming a Hafiz? How many paras, how many juice are you going to learn in a month? How many pages are you going to learn? You don't know these things. So if you don't know, you need to make a plan. Sometimes what I would recommend is to sit down with a Hafiz of a Quran and then make the plan with them because it will give you, um, it will make it easy for you to do that. So we all probably know a Hafiz. Otherwise, Ramadan's coming up. You're going to meet a Hafiz who's going to be leading Salah. Maybe get in touch with them. So what is your initial goal? For adults, I would say the best way to start is start with Juz Amma. And that's probably everybody. The initial goal for everybody should be, I want to memorize Juz Amma. Why? Because then my Salah will become better. Then maybe you can move on to the next goal, the next goal, the next goal, and then initially the rest of the Quran will easily come to you. So basically make a plan for each phase. And inshallah, I'll speak about plans in each phase shortly. Now also work out while you're intending to become a Hafiz or to memorize the Quran, work out how much time can you commit, right? Be realistic with yourself, right? Don't say I'm going to spend all my free time. That doesn't make any sense, right? That means you won't spend any time, right? So what you need to do is spend 
and really commit and say to yourself, okay, on Mondays, it's really tough at work because it's the first day of the week. I'm not going to memorize Quran that day. But on Wednesdays, I know my work life gets a bit easier. I'm not stressed out at work. So I'm going to memorize Quran Wednesday, Thursdays and Fridays. Now, I know on Saturdays, Sundays, I have to do all my chores for the house. But I'm not going to do it then. Maybe. Maybe you're a stay at home mom. If you're a stay at, stay at home mom, then you are going to say, actually, you know what? I think Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. is the best time for me because my children are at school. You don't know. Maybe you're a dad who works, you know, loads of hours and then you have to come home and do other things then you can say okay for me saturday and sunday maybe so uh, maybe you're a college student who has only weekends free so then you can say i'm gonna commit my weekend so what you really need to do is understand your own timetable and be realistic with yourself on how much time are you really going to commit to learning the quran once you've worked that out you can plan your news lesson your previous lesson and your revision around that okay Trust me, it's not going to work. And I can guarantee you this with my experience of being in HIFS class for years myself and teaching HIFS class for years. And I can guarantee you this, that if you do not make a commitment and you leave it to be free flowing, then you will not commit more than a few weeks because your motivation will run out. You need to have a structure in place on when exactly is it that you're going to commit. And once you've chosen that time, once you've chosen that day, then I would say is, um, uh, you know, don't, don't even let an earthquake stop you basically, right? Don't let anything come on the way. Now I will talk about what time is the best to learn, but that depends on how much time you have. Okay. And then inshallah, we'll speak about that. Lastly, make lots of dua every single day after every single salah your dua should be ya allah make me a preserver of the quran this should be without a miss that dua should be as important as everything gets okay so i would say you know just just basically remember uh, you know make dua endlessly now remember right to become a preserver of the Quran is a God-given gift. It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is placing in your hearts after he sees your effort. Now, the truth is this, that if we don't keep asking, no matter how much we keep trying, we will not be able to accomplish the task without Allah's help. So this is why we need to make dua day after day, day after day, make dua after Jumu'ah, make your dua, Sa'atul Ijaba, make dua, Tahajjud time, make dua. Every single time you should be making dua. Right. So this is why, you know, like um, I, I still remember that I never used to take this dua part very seriously because I obviously studied the hips when I was young. Right. So I used to think, yeah, just, you know, do your effort and you get on with it. So I, I realized that after starting to make dua, that's only when it started opening up. Until then, it was very bumpy. Right. So that's why you have to make dua and never Never, never, ever, right? Um, you know, look down upon the power of dua. Remember that as Muslims, we are required to do two things effort and hope, right? We make effort for the sake of Allah and we hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without dua, there is no real hope. So let's look at this make a plan for each phase again. So in general, this is the phase that I generally um, recommend. But again, this is not a bulletproof phase, 100%. This is something that should be worked around. But I generally think that a person should have five phases of their learning. So initial phase should always be, I'm going to learn the Jews 30, the last Jews, Amma Yatasa'alun, up to Surah Al-Nas. Okay, so this is my initial, um, um, should be my initial goal. So what I would do is I would say that go and make a timeline for it. Give yourself one year to learn this or two years to learn this. Then find out, divide it, do some maths. Divide it into weeks. How many weeks do I need to do? So if I've got 52 weeks to learn Juz Amma, let me find out how many pages there are. There are in the Mus'haf that I use, there's about 40 pages. So I'm going to read, okay, 40, 52. That means I have to only learn one, about, you know, three quarters of a page a day. Um, a week. Now, how do I learn three quarters of a page a week? I only need to sit down twice a week and learn half of that each time. So now I know that my new lesson only takes two sessions a week of one hour, for example. So we need to do some basic, really basic maths to split out how am I going to go and complete this phase. Now, if you're a micromanaging person, you can make that into 20 phases. You can make that into 10 phases, however you want, but you need to break it down and make goals for each phase okay number two is 
Then phase two is what I recommend is go for your often read surahs. Pick five often read surahs. So for a lot of people, for example, in in um, on Friday. They read Surah Al-Kahf. Sometimes they read Yasin whenever things get difficult. Sometimes you see people they read Waqi'ah after Maghrib. They say, you know, after Maghrib every day to read Waqi'ah is a great virtue. There's also Surah Al-Mulk. A lot of people read that some nights before they go to sleep. The Surah Al-Dukhan. That's you know on Fridays it's recommended to read Surah Al-Dukhan as well as well as Kahf. So all of these, if you find yourself regularly reading some surahs of the Quran, then try to memorize those because those will be easier for you. Those will be easier for you okay so what i would say is um you know find again find a new time frame so count up how many pages you have to learn maybe that comes up to 70 pages now give yourself a certain time now like i said when it comes to time frames you need to work that out for yourself what can you realistically do if you're only going to be able to commit two hours a week then okay say to yourself i can learn probably maybe try try to error some things and say i can learn maybe one page in two hours or maybe half a page in two hours and then times that by 70 pages and see how long you're going to realistically take it doesn't matter if you're going to take long there is no race okay the only race we're doing is fastabikul khairat is race towards goodness right so that's the only race we should be involved in and all of it is goodness then i would say phase three is to go down to just 29 and 28 because they are the longer surahs but they're very similar to just 30. So they make it easy to learn, but at the same time, it gives us an experience on how long surahs work, how longer ayats work. So this is um, this definitely um, is the best next, the third best, and this is what I think. But obviously, for other students, they might think otherwise. If they don't often read the often read surahs, then they could probably put just twenty nine and thirty next, and things like that. But in general, you will see that twenty nine and twenty eight are very easy to memorize, and it gives you a real experience in hips. Okay, and this is why you know I always recommend my students to go all the way up to twenty eight before we go to Surah Al Baqarah, which is the next part. Now in Surah Surah Al-Baqarah is when they learn the system of hips and when you learn the system of hips, okay? And what that basically means is you've now learned, you could almost say around four juz because you've learned all these long surahs and you've learned 29, 28, and 30. So it's about four juz worth of learning you've done. And now when you move to Surah Al-Baqarah, you come as an experienced student. And Surah Al-Baqarah is very long and Surah Al-Baqarah is very tiring. Surah Al-Baqarah really tests you, right? It actually tests you. Right. And this is, I would say, is the make or break for a person that if they can get through Baqarah, they can probably get through the rest of the Quran. Right. So this is when Surah Al-Baqarah comes. You really break down Surah Al-Baqarah, find out how many pages a week you're learning, how many um, lines even a week you're learning, split them up, get into the system and routine of doing um, new lesson, previous lesson and revision, get in the system. And I'll speak about the system, but get in the system of doing that. Once you get into the system of doing that, inshallah, the rest of the Quran should be easy. So for children, should you also try this method? I would say yes, 100%. For me, for me I, I, I try this on the children that I work with when it comes to hills. But in general, I would say work with your teacher. OK, work with the teacher that is teaching your child. Right. You should definitely consult them. You should definitely speak with them and see how is it that we can make sure that these phases are correct. So it's very important to have that communication. And I'm telling you, teachers appreciate it. Why? Because they know you're going to help them out trying to get that goal that they're trying to reach as well. So this is why speak about phases, see what phases will be. Um, um, suitable for children. So most importantly, what I would say is just 30 and then the second phase, those are the two most important phase, which is the often read surahs. If you've made the child read or you yourself have read surahs Yasin every day for the, every year, every month for the last like 10 years, then definitely memorize Yasin first. It's going to be easy. If you've, if you've been reciting Surah Al-Mulk every night or every other night before you go to sleep, memorize Surah Al-Mulk. Now, I remember when I was studying, we were required to read Surah Al-Mulk after Isha in, 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 our, in our school, in our madrasa every single day. So when I went to Surah Al-Mulk to memorize, I literally done it in two days because I was used to reciting it every day and it was, I was already very, very familiar with it. So this is, um, um, so this is definitely uh, which, uh, uh, a way that works. So I would say phase the Quran out. Going to the next uh, slide, uh, consistency. Okay, now 
once you've decided how much you're going to commit commit a set amount regularly okay don't sit down with the intention of i'll memorize as much as you can as i can no you should already know that I'm going to sit down and memorize this much. This is my goal, okay? Now, obviously, sometimes you might not meet that goal, but you should always have a goal of how much you're sitting down to read. You should never sit down just wondrously and thinking however much I read, I, I, I will learn. If you go with that attitude, it's going to be very, very difficult to kind of plan and then keep up with the plan. And then, you know, otherwise your motivation will die out. So this is something you need to do. Commit a set amount regularly. Start with the minimum. And I always say, start with one line, okay? There is no shame in learning one line. Don't think that you've underperformed. Every time you sit down, start with one line. Now do some maths and this gives you motivation. Like if you do three lines a day, that's only that's already three and a half juice a year. In nine years, you'll become a half is, right? So nine years is not a lot if you're looking at a full-time job and you're doing a lot, right? Um, you know, you're doing a lot in life, you know, nine years to achieve one of the greatest achievements of your life. It's not a lot, right? Um, you know, so, you know, people, I've seen people save up nine years to buy a car, you know? So <laughs> three lines a day, three lines a day is no problem, right? So think about it like that, break it down. Don't just think about, you know, it's such a big thing and a big book. Don't do that. Break it down to micro levels. Like I only need to do two lines. I need to do five lines. I can only do six lines. And then gradually improve as you go along. Don't be scared. But remember, consistency is key. Uh, if you do not become consistent, if you do not become consistent, then it will become tough. And you're going to remember that you started this mission to become a Hafiz one day in six months time. Every Ramadan, you're going to regret it and try to do it again. Then three months later, you're going to attempt again. Two months later, you're going to attempt again. Before you know it, you spent three years and you haven't even done a juice, right? Why? Because you haven't been consistent. So that's the that's what it comes down to. Quality is better than quantity, okay? And this one is very important, especially with children. Do not force your children. I always humbly request my uh, students' parents that please, please, please do not focus on how many juice your child has done how many quarters they done how many pages they've done how many you know juice they have to do this year and stuff like that sometimes break it down to quality right if you take a year to do three juice and you remember that three juice properly it is better than doing the full 30 juice and trying to spend your whole life trying to recall that 30 juice so it's always better to go look at quality but remember, the goal should not go away. So what you have to figure out, and the golden question is this, how much quality amount of Quran can I learn in the time that I can commit? Okay, so it's a very general question, but if you can answer that, you can probably find your consistency. Okay, how much quality amount of Quran can I learn, okay, by committing the time I, uh, I can? Okay, so this is so important, inshallah. The next one is timing. Okay, so remember I spoke about timing and I said, okay, figure out uh, your kind of weekly schedule and make some time for the Quran. So, you know, say to yourself, okay, I'm going to give five five minutes there and 10, sorry, um, an hour on Wednesday, an hour on Friday. Those are the two hours that I'm really good at. Okay, so what I would say is this, okay, at the beginning, start with say 10 different timings over the week okay so this is where trial and error comes in okay and trial those times okay so over the next three weeks or four weeks try to trial different times and say okay on a monday night even though i have a long day on monday for example the, me personally speaking my longest day is monday so even though i have a long day on monday what would happen is can i still memorize that day you never know your brain just might work better you don't know right or let me try on Thursday nights when I'm not that, when I'm relaxed. Let me see how I feel on my day off, okay? You might see that on your day off, you're the worst at memorizing because you're used to relaxing. So you need to test out different times. Once you've tested them out, write them down, see what the results are, how easy do you find it, and then pick those times, the ones that work, okay? So this is so important. Now, originally and traditionally we would always say that wake up in the morning first thing in the morning after fajr recite uh, there was one mother that i was attending we was reciting before fajr right now the thing is does that work yes it does for many children does it work for adults not for everybody it's sometimes very difficult if you went to sleep 12 at night there's no way you're memorizing quran at 5 a.m 
right? It's just difficult, right? Unless you have the strength. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us strong like that. But in general, it's very, very difficult. If you work, you know, um, nights, for example, if you work evenings, it's going to be difficult to do after Fajr, right? At the same time, if you've got a long laborious day in front of you, you might find it hard to reset Quran in the morning. Some, sometimes, you know, so that's why you need to test out different timings. So it's not always about, you know, the best time is this time. There's nothing like that. Instead, you need to work on different timings. Next one is find your golden time. Like I said, find the one that works. And once you find your golden time, use that. Okay, use that. Do that research and use it. Thirdly, create learning intervals. Don't sit down to recite the Quran for two hours nonstop. Okay, you're going to get bored. Your brain's going to stop working. Your brain's going to not take any more. Okay, so think about it like this, okay? We have sponge, okay? Those who've done any dishes in the last couple of weeks will probably know what I'm talking about. So you know your sponge, there's only so much liquid that your sponge can hold and dispense, right? So let's say I have a sponge here and then I fill it up with some liquid. I put some liquid on it, okay? So nobody get at me for washing dishes like this, okay? I really do, so when I do, it's not perfect. So I usually do this, that I put some um, uh, liquid onto the sponge. Then I get a plate and I, I would wash it. Then I'll get another one, I would wash it. Then I get another one, then I would wash it. By the time I've got to like seventh, eighth or ninth spawn, um, ninth plate, guess what? There's no more liquid left, right? Then what, what, what does that mean? That means this sponge, I can wipe all day. It won't clean as effectively as it did for the first plate. Exactly the same when it comes to memorizing. Your brain is like a sponge. It runs out of juice right so this is the best metaphor to put it in so what you need to do is create intervals find out how often how long does it take for you to become tired if it's half an hour then take a break right find another interval like you know say i'll come back in three hours i'll speak come back in two hours if you're one of those people that can actually learn for an hour then learn for an hour if you can learn for two hours learn for two hours this is probably one of the most important things we need to do with our children as well which is we usually put them in a room lock it not lock it up but literally shut the door and say go in there and read for two hours really is you know can we do that right after 20 minutes he's thinking or she is thinking about games and thinking about what happened to school and who done what and all of these things sometimes if they have a mobile phone then obviously those two hours is going on the mobile phone so that's why create learning intervals find what the optimal time is and as soon as we find that then we move on to the next interval okay so it could be only recite quran for half an hour at night and then do half an hour in the morning right maybe um you could find a revision time which doesn't require that much um uh you know um seclusion and then you know things like that so work around it inshallah creating an environment now this is very important as well because if we don't create an environment to learn in okay then we're not going to ever find ourselves in the mood to learn okay so creating environment is find a dedicated place number one is we should find a dedicated place Okay, so um, now what do we mean by dedicated place? Now, let me tell you, right? Um, different people have different dedicated places. Don't rely on other people's dedicated place. Now, for example, me, when I teach, this is my dedicated place. I love teaching from this specific spot. Okay, so this is my dedicated space. Now, if I invite you to my dedicated space, you probably won't be able to do the same uh, or have the same feeling as me. So remember this, everybody has a different way of learning. Some people, they can read, like my father, he reads on the dining table. Now, someone like me, I can never read a book or go and do any work on a dining table because there's so much noise. They, you know, they, you've got uh, my, children, my, my child, you've got my brother's child running around the house, and then they're all, like, you know, disturbing, and I, I'm not able to do it. But my father can do it. So that's his dedicated place. Do we understand? So everybody has a different dedicated place. We need to test it out. We need to find it. If we're dealing with our children, again, we need to ask them, okay, let's see how you do here today. Let's see how you do over here tomorrow, right? Let's try bedroom today. Let's try the study room. Let's try the living room. Let's try the dining room. Try different rooms. Some people love learning in a noisy environment. Some people hate learning in a noisy environment. But we need to give the ability to students to find that, find that exact place. So that's why it's very important that we find a dedicated place. And once we find our dedicated place, then we can start to enhance on that. 
Next is remove all distractions. The most important thing to remove as distractions is our mobile phones. Because at the end of the day, you know, you're never really alone if you are with your mobile phone, right? So if you have a smart, especially, you know what? I can't even say especially smartphones because even if you have those brick phones, it can be as distracting, right? So this is why it's so important that in terms of creating an environment, we need to know what is a real distraction. What is a real distraction? What distracts me? You know, sometimes, you know, when I was, when we were studying in Madrasa, our teacher never used to allow us to have hoodies on with strings, okay? So at the beginning, I used to always think, what is he talking about, right? Why wouldn't I allow, you know, it's cold morning. Why am I not allowed a hoodie on, right? He only used to allow us to have cardigans like this on or with zips on. So one day I realized because, you know, once we, we started wearing hoodies because our heater wasn't working in the Madrasa, and those are stories we can go on forever. But what happened is we seen that people start chewing uh, the string that comes out of their hood, right? So imagine that this is a distraction. Now, this could be worse than a smartphone for this person, right? So you need to see what is that person's distraction. Do not put one lid on all distractions. Some people are not distracted by smartphones. Some people are. Some people are not distracted by hoodies. Some people are. So you need to find what is that distraction and kind of remove that from your life or from your session when you're sitting down. Now, next one is surround yourself with recitation. Now, I always recommend Sheikh Husari, okay, uh, Rahimahullah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illuminate his grave, one of the greatest reciters of all time, um, the, probably the only, one and only reciter I listen to, but to surround yourself with always with recitation. Why? The more you listen to the Quran, the easier it becomes to listen to, to, to memorize the Quran. So, you know, find a Sheikh that you like listening to and, you know, and then just keep listening to him, keep listening to him, especially the surahs and the ayahs that you are learning at the moment. Okay. So make it your task. And, the, you know, one of the ways that we um, tell students to memorize is to listen to the ayah 20 times before they even memorize. And I'll speak about about that um, after in detail but in general you have to surround yourself with recitation so if you're on a bus put earphones on and listen to recitation you drive put recitation on on your car when you're alone if you are doing nothing right uh, just scrolling on your phone or something put some recitation on if you have a house uh, where you're allowed to like have speakers and stuff and place uh, things then play some recitation in your room right however it is surround yourself with recitation if you know somebody who has a nice recitation ask them to recite if you find a masjid whether whether a reciter or whether imam reads really uh, nice then go to that masjid travel there and learn and and, re and listen to the quran right so surround yourself with listening to the quran find a recitation partner now i've stressed enough and enough over over the last you know hour you could say about finding a good teacher but another thing you should do is find a recitation partner alhamdulillah when we were studying we i had a recitation partner may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from him um he helped me all the way we finished on the same day as well um i think it was like a couple of hours difference and we were racing all the way but that's another thing you can do is find a recitation partner now what's important is what your partner should have the same commitment level as you so for example if you're reciting three days a week your partner should be on three days a week why it will keep you motivated now mentor is good as well if you find a half is a person who's already memorized the quran or who's memorizing but has done much more than you then you can use them as a mentor a mentor is very different to partner a partner would be able to listen to you can give you point your mistakes you point their mistakes tell each other your struggles tell each other you know share your sorrows you could say and then eventually you will get through this journey easily so it's always you know they say that um you know you go faster alone but you go further together right so you know try to go for that uh, method which is i'm trying to go further so let's go with somebody and then lastly you need to learn how to recite daily in salah okay that um, you, uh, you, you, you should recite daily in Salah. Now, this is very important as well. There's no point learning so many Jews of the Quran. And then when it comes to your Salah, you're still reading Kul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Falak and Kul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas, right? There's no point doing that because the whole idea of you reciting and learning and memorizing the Quran is so that you can utilize it in the most, uh, the best of worships, which is Salah. So, always give yourself target of how much you're going to recite in salah my teacher you know may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
um, you know, bless him and you know, uh, give him success in dunya and akhirah. He recites the full Quran in salah. So what would happen is, uh, let's say today he starts from Surah Al-Baqarah in, in Zuhr, he'll carry on where he left off in Fajr. In Asr, he, he carries on where he left off in Zuhr. In Maghrib, he'll carry on where he left off in Zuhr, uh, in, in Asr. So like that, every salah he continues until you could say 15 days, 10 days, 15 days later, he finished the whole Quran and then he starts again. Um, so you know, so this is why um, this is why it's important that we recite daily in salah, and then that way this will do half the revision for us. Um, and then lastly, your diet, or the next thing is your diet and lifestyle. While you're reciting and trying to learn, on the, especially the days that you've dedicated to reciting Quran, <coughs> you should have some sort of diet in place. So avoid overeating, because when you overeat, it makes you sluggish, and then you're not able to recite, especially loudly, clearly, and you're not able to memorize. Or eat food which are good for the memory. Now, there are lots of studies done on this. Some of the things that I've found was raisins, you have dates, and then you have almonds, and then there's other like omega oil and things like that. Maybe you could try out different things and see if those things kind of give you some, um, um, give you some more energy to learn. Always keep clean and tidy. It's essential that a person who's a companion of the Quran to always be clean and tidy. Why? Because when you're feeling good, uh, when you're looking good or when you're, uh, you know, dressed well, then you're going to be feeling good. And when you're feeling good, it becomes easy to learn. Lastly, remain in the state of wudu. Remember, you should be reciting all the time. So remain in the state of wudu, okay, as much as you can. And that way, if you remain in the state of wudu, one, um, one extra thing that I've found is anytime you're practicing over the Quran, anytime you're practicing over the Quran, if you get stuck, you can quickly find the Quran near you, find the page, look at it and think, oh, okay, yeah, you know, this is where I got stuck on and then leave it and then carry on reciting in the back of your head somewhere. And then that is always a good way of doing so. Um, inshallah, um, we've just got a few more slides left. I was hoping to finish this in uh, within one hour, 10 minutes, um, but it looks like we're going over. Now, now we've gone back to the uh, main thing, which is the some common methods of memorizing, okay? So these, um, I've actually only listed out three methods. But what I always would tell students is try different methods. Don't just stick to one method until you find the golden method for yourself, okay? So find the golden method for yourself and inshallah that will probably help you out much more, okay? But um, I will basically state the three methods that I've found to be the most helpful for myself. Um, one of the method is, uh, is one that I use. I won't mention which one to just so you don't think that that's the golden method. And other two methods I've got is by consulting friends and family that have gone through HIVS so that we can kind of um, give you loads of things to test out. Okay, so method one is learn each line for five minutes with the finger following each word. So, for example, let's say we have an example where re le we're learning something like Surah Al-Nas. So you got nas, malikin nas, ilahin nas. So that's about one line. So what you should do is for a full five minutes, you should try to recite for five whole minutes. Once you've learned it for five minutes, try to recall each line and continue to do so until you can recall the whole ayah without any assistance. So, for example, let's say I look inside my Quran and said, uh, you know, for five whole minutes. After I've done that, I should close the Quran and try to recite it. Okay, so I say, and then I'm not sure what is next. So what then what I can do is go back to the Quran look at it and nas i'm not sure what's next go back to the quran and say ilahi nas keep doing that until i can read the full line and which might take two to three minutes i can read the full line without referring back to the quran without referring back to an assistant so if i can do it like that then i've learned one ayah then i go to the next ayah and i do the exact same thing the next line and i do the exact same thing then I go to the third line and I do the exact same thing. And then I try to join all three lines. Okay. So, and then when I'm, if, if I'm struggling to join all three lines, I keep repeating it without looking until I can repeat, uh, until I can say the whole three lines without any assistant at all. So this is one method. Okay. So again, just to recap the method, you look inside with your finger on the ayah for five whole minutes. And then after that, you try to read it without any assistant looking out. You might have to go back and forth, back and forth until you are able to read it without any problem. Then you move to the next ayah again, five whole minutes. 
repeat the whole procedure, third ayah, and every three ayah, try to recite all three lines together. Okay? Okay. Method two. What's the method two? Recite the entire target 20 times. So, for example, let's say you've decided that you're going to learn three lines every time you sit down. So, you're going for three lines at a time. So, recite all three lines at least 20 times. When you do that with your finger on it, again, why do you put your finger on it? You're creating a memory that will follow that finger. And you'll know what I'm talking about when you try it. So, you do that 20 times. Once you've done that 20 times, after that, you recite each line once looking in and once looking out. So, how it would do is, for example, I would reach the full Surah to Nas 20 times looking in with my finger on it after that i will read looking in then i shut the quran and then i might struggle a bit then i'll look in to help me out and then i'll try to finish the sentence then i'll go and finish the line then i'll go back to the quran looking in once looking out once looking in once looking out once every time i get stuck i take assistance Okay, every time I, I, I get stuck, I'm going to take assistance from the Quran until I can say the line without any problem. Then I move to the next one. Then I move to the next one. So this is another way of doing it. And once you reach, for example, your full target area, you will try to read all three lines or four lines or how much you're trying to learn in one go. So that's another way. Okay. Now, method three. Now, this one is for more of people who find it difficult to repeat, repeat, repeat. One of the ways to do it is listen to the ayah or line 20 times with your following, with your finger following each and every word. Okay. So one of the websites that you can use, let me let me show you this website. This is called tanzil.net. Okay. So here, if you go to this website, what you can do is it lets you it lets you choose an ayah at a time and then you can just keep it on repeat repeat so if we go here al husari and then i press play and then i can easily press this and say okay i want it to repeat unlimited amount of times which is easily going to be 20 times and then i play this ayah with my finger on the quran so let's say i do this i listen to it 20 times once i've listened to it 20 times then recite each line once looking in and once looking out and then that is another way and this usually works for people people who memorize better through their ears so that's another way that you can try and then repeat until you can read the whole line from memory and then once you've catched up to like say three four or five ayahs then you can start to read the whole thing together inshallah okay so those are the three methods okay and again these are not the only three methods there are hundreds of way to recite the quran i've left three there just for you to test it out i believe majority of the people would find some relief in these three methods and be able to kind of memorize the quran the now obviously what would happen is eventually methods of rev revision okay now what was what's going to happen is you're going to start accumulating different parts okay so now what happens is let's say you've decided okay and i'm going to give a scenario as simple as possible and you can break this down according to your own situation let's say you do quran you memorize quran every mondays every wednesdays and every fridays okay so so let's say you've memorized three lines today monday three lines on wednesday and three lines on friday so once you've memorized on friday you have two last parts so the way to do previous lesson revision is to always focus on the last seven subjects or the last seven new parts so first of all you need to read the last part so for example whatever it is that you've learned previously you will recite that seven times from memory now you're gonna get stuck you might get stuck the third time the first time if you get stuck you do not count that it has to be seven times from memory once you've done that seven times, you work on the second last part that you've learned. So for example, let's say today's Friday and whatever I learned on month Wednesday is the last part. Okay. So I will read that seven times from memory, but whatever I've learned on Monday, that's my second last part. I should be able to read that six times from memory. Then I go to what I learned last Friday. That's my third last part. I should be able to read that five times from memory. And then what, what I read the last Wednesday, which is the fourth last part, I should be reading that four 
times from memory. Like that, you go all the way to the last seventh last part, and you should be able to read that at least once from memory. Now, if you add this up, okay, seven plus six plus five plus four plus three plus two plus one, you'll probably see that you have been reading that one part from memory over 30 times. Now, if you can recite something from memory over 30 times, it's very unlikely you'll ever forget it, okay? So this is called the seven last part rule, okay? The seven day rule, you could say. It was coined, uh, I first um, I first found this um, in, um, I first uh, found this in Sheikh Ashraf Ali Tanwi Rahimahullah's book on uh, where he discusses and gives lots of advice for students, okay? But I'm sure this has been around for a long time because this is works miracles. You can all, also do this for your like uh, notes of college notes, school notes and things like that. It, proper works. I also advise this to our um, Islamic studies students to try this uh, in notes fashion and it works as well. So you should try to be reading uh, at least altogether you're going to end up reading like 30 times or 20 something times your last um, uh, you know seven days of Sabbath and then eventually you're never going to forget it again inshallah. So just to repeat the last seven uh, rules part is that basically that every last revision. So for example, you need to trace back what's the last seven revisions that you've done and try to read them all from memory. Now, what you need to do is read what you've learned the last time, seven times from memory, what you've done the second last time, six times from memory, and what you've done the third last time, five times from memory, okay? So basically in general, if you break it down, okay? Let's say today is Saturday and you've learned Quran every day, new three new lines every single day since last Saturday. So you have seven days, okay? Now what that basically means on, you're going to learn Friday's Sabbath, you're gonna say it seven times from memory, Thursday's Sabbath, six times from memory, Wednesday's Sabbath, five times from memory, Tuesday Sabbat, three times from memory, Monday Sabbat, two times from memory, and Sunday Sabbat, once from memory. Now, if you do that, if you do that, you have read from memory almost, almost 30 times, okay? And then that will obviously, uh, you will, and very unlikely, you'll ever forget it again. Okay, now we have regular revision, okay? So when it comes to regular revision, a person should recite at least 10% of what you have memorized daily. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to recite it uh, all looking um, all uh, looking out, okay? So you don't have to recite it all looking out. You can recite it looking in. But the minimum should be that you should be reciting 10% of everything you've learned so that in 10 days, you have completely revised every single thing, okay? So basically, let's say you've done one juz, you should be reading around two to three pages of revision a day. Every week, uh, every 10 days, you will be finishing that juice. So what would happen is there is no time for your brain to forget it. Remember, the Quran is like a, you know, a wild camel. It, you know, it just wants to set itself loose. So this is how the hadith it literally describes the Quran. So similarly, you can't give it time. You can't give it too much time. So you should be reciting at least looking in 10% of what you have memorized. If you memorize the full Quran, you should be reciting three juz a day, which is not a lot. It takes less than an hour to do it if you do it quite fast, especially if you don't read out loud too much, then you can do it in like 45 minutes because you don't have to worry about pronunciation and the tajweed rules. So really and truly 10% of what you've memorized, you should be reciting every day just before you go to bed or something. Recite longer portions in Salah. This is a part of regular revision. You have to do that. If you've learned Surah Juz Amma, full Juz Amma, you should be going through the full Juz Amma every week in Salah. Minimum. This is like the minimum, right? Now, if a person wants to try extra hard, then you can easily do it every three days, every two days. Read commentaries of the surahs you have memorized. If you can take lessons, if you can find shuyukh that give lessons on that particular ayat that you've memorized, if you can find courses that do the um, um, commentary of the Quran, then go for them, right? Listen to them because that will attach you to those ayats. And once you're attached to those ayats, you're thinking about those ayats. And if you're thinking about those ayats, you are remembering those ayats. So that's generally the ge general sense of how to do regular revision. However, if you are in a system, a class, then most likely your teacher will give you a set portion of revision that you should be giving. And obviously you should be adhering to that set portion because that will ultimately give you the cycle that you need to make sure that you do not forget 
the uh, you do not forget the, what you have memorized. Okay. So inshallah, this is the end of our um, class. Um, alhamdulillah, uh, we didn't go too, I, I believe we didn't go too much over. Forgive me if I've taken up too much time. And lastly, I just want to remind you, uh, mashallah, those people who have kind of, um, uh, who have sponsored our, our course today, inshallah, do check them out and do uh, give them the support.